and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers, devour, devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. Boy, God has spoke to my heart reading this. You should have been as Sodom and should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Verse 18 will conclude our reading. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If correctly read, that's Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 18. You can be seated, and I'm going to ask my dear pastor friend, Brother Don, if you would, to pray for me, brother, and pray for this service. Amen. Amen.
Yes, you're worthy, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Brother Don. I want to preach this morning, possibly tonight. I don't know how this is going to go. I'm just going to go with God. But I want to address the subject, can America the beautiful become America in bondage? Can, is it possible, America the beautiful become America in bondage? I think you'll see the parallels before we get finished this morning in the message. I hope that you will. I studied a little bit. I actually was just kind of reading in the book of Isaiah yesterday morning. And God outlined the chapter. He'll do that for a preacher every once in a while. It'll just, just one right after another, after another. Bang, 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 bang. And then I was just wondering, Lord, is that the direction? And when I looked at it last night, it was kind of like chewing on something. And the more that you chew, the bigger that it got. The month of July is a month when I think because of Independence Day, we put a little more effort into honoring our flag and recognizing our liberties that we have in America. And I think more about it. I mean, when December comes, we think more about the birth of Christ. When March and April comes, we're thinking more about the resurrection. Not that we don't think of it all the time. Not that we shouldn't be patriotic all the time. But I think about our country, especially this time of year. I'm concerned about America. The parallels that I'm seeing in the Word of God. Already the northern kingdom here has been taken down by the Assyrians. That's already happened. Israel's already been taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And now they're knocking at the door of Jerusalem. 185,000 strong outside the city. And Isaiah, Hezekiah has heard a, had a word from God and, and God told him, no, they're not going to have the victory over Judah. And they're going to wait a little while and what's going to happen, God told him in a prophetic way that they're going to be taken in by Babylon. That they're going to come under that captivity rather than the captivity of the Assyrians. I don't know about you, but I have children, I have grandchildren. And I think anybody that does not have their head buried in the sand should be much concerned about the direction that our country is headed in. Brother Brian mentioned something this morning in Sunday school. And uh, I, I looked it up. It, it, this is growing by the moment. If you look at the national debt, that thing is turning over by the moment. I mean, dollars, 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 dollars. It takes, I think, over 70% of the gross uh, product now, domestic product, the GDP, just to pay uh, the interest on the debt that we have in America $291,000 for every person is what it would take today to pay off the national debt or $747,809 for every household. I'm telling you, it's rolling, rolling, rolling. And you say, preacher, what's that got to do with the book of Isaiah? Well, it has a lot to do with it and I'll, I'll, I will show you here in a little bit. I brought this up last week in Sunday school, and I think it fits again this morning, and you'll understand why a little bit later. In 1984, Adrian Rogers made this statement. He said, friend, you cannot legislate the poor into freedom by legislating the wealthy out of freedom. He said, and what one person receives without working for, another person must work for without receiving. The government cannot give to anybody anything that the government does not first take from somebody. And when half of the people get the idea, they don't have to work because the other half's going to take care of them. And when the other half get the idea, it does no good to work because somebody's going to get what I work for. He said, that, dear friend, is about the end of any nation. 
I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but we're about 50-50 in America now. And I believe with all of my heart there needs to be a return to scriptural principles and to the word of God. I believe that's the only hope for America is revival. I'm talking about revival. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about real, genuine, Holy Ghost revival where hearts are changed and where men once again believe the Bible when it said if a man doesn't work, a man shouldn't eat. I'll guarantee you this, beloved. There's a big difference between being disabled to work and being unwilling to work. And we've come up with a government that's rewarding people that are unwilling to work. There's a big difference. I want to say some things this morning I believe that will be a blessing and be a help. I'm still just trying to introduce the message. But can America the beautiful become American bondage? I'm, what I'm going to read to you right now comes from a book in call, in called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. How many are you aware that the Roman Empire was huge? It was big. It looked like the Titanic and that no one could sink the Roman Empire. But watch this and listen carefully, please. The first step towards decline, he lists as undermining of the dignity and the sanctity of the home. Let me just say this. That's not new. That's been going on ever since I've been in this world. I come in this world the last day of 1959, and I'm telling you, beloved, in the 60s, the hippies hit the scene, and they called it free sex and free love. I'm going to say something about sin. It's never been free, and it never will be. I'm telling you, a home will pay the price for sin. A nation will pay the price for sin. And so the first decline was getting away from the sanctity of the home. Now we're living in a nation where a man can marry a man and adopt children. And a woman can marry a woman and adopt children. You say, preacher, you've lost your mind. No, I'm telling you right now, beloved, Isaiah's fixing to cry out against some things. And beloved, God wants us to get our attention and realize that we can become a nation under bondage. Listen, the second step includes higher and higher taxes and the spending of public money for free bread and the circuses for the populace. The third step, this man said, was a mad craze for pleasure and sports, becoming every year more exciting, more brutal, and more immoral. I'm going to say something today. I used to watch boxing. I used to. I, and, you know, they put on the gloves. There's rules. You can only hit the man. You know, you can't hit him below the belt. You and the kidney punches were not accepted. All that. Well, they got fighting out now. Listen, you don't even have to wear gloves. You can kick anywhere, hit anywhere, blood going everywhere. They're trying to kill the other, the other man. And I believe, listen, that it's prevalent in our nation. Uh, there are people today that ought to be in the house of God that are sitting in a sports arena somewhere. Are you listening to me? I'm telling you there are people today that ought to be in the house of God. But they stayed home to watch something, some sporting event on the television. Are you listening to me this morning? I believe Isaiah's on track. And listen, the fall of the Roman Empire started with the decline of the home. And then it goes to the higher and higher taxes. Then the third thing was that mad craze for pleasure. The fourth thing was the building of great armaments when the real enemy was within. I believe, I believe America needs to have a strong army. But I'm going to tell you something right now. I believe for the most part this country does not realize the enemy that's living inside of its borders. We're living in a society that's anti-God, anti-Bible. And beloved, listen, we're swiftly becoming smaller and smaller as the remnant of God's people. And then the fifth thing was the decay of religion fading into a mere form losing touch with life, and losing power to guide the people. Uh, the Apostle Paul said it like this, having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. Everything this morning with a steeple and a cross on top of it is not a church of the living God. I'm telling you, beloved, this morning you can go to so-called church in a lot of places and they'll never open this book. Amen. They've got them a little pamphlet 
They've got them a little word from headquarters. I tell you, thank God Almighty, God's people's headquarters is not on earth. Our headquarters is in heaven. We need to hear from heaven. We need to hear from the word of God. We need the Holy Ghost to, to speak to our hearts. A nation's decline begins with spiritual apostasy, which is followed by moral awfulness and results. Now listen, we're almost there in political anarchy. We're almost there. You can make accusations without one ounce of proof. I'm telling you, beloved, we need to be praying. And we need to understand that that flag and this liberty that we celebrate this month is in trouble. And listen, if we don't stand for what's right, I'm telling you, years ago, I can't remember who the preacher is. Brother Don may remember. But I'm telling you, there was a preacher that said the answer is in the pulpits of America. The answer is in getting back to the Word of God. The answer is in the heart of God's people. Hezekiah turned to the Lord. Isaiah is giving a word. God gave me five words as I look through the chapter. And I want to begin this morning. The first word is the word rebellion. Look in the Bible here. It said in verse number two, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. How many believes it's time we pay attention to what he said? It's not what I say that's important. It's what God says that's important. He said, I have nourished and brought up children. And they have rebelled against me. How many believes God has nourished this country? How many believes this country was raised up on the principles of the word of God? And God said they have rebelled against me. There may be some in this uh, congregation today. Listen, you can do your best to raise your children. For the glory of God and to serve God. I'm going to tell you something. God raised up a nation and they rebelled. They rebelled against the holy God. I've said this before and I'll say it again. God did not, did not make the children of Israel puppets. He did not just pull their strings. Beloved, he did not make Adam and Eve puppets. And he will not allow us to make our children puppets. They're going to have to come a day, beloved, when they make up their own mind about which way they can go or which way they will go. I'll say this, beloved, the universities in America, if they have any effect, listen, it won't be going for God. Amen. They'll be going against the things of God. So we need homes that are strong. We need homes where there's prayer being made. We need homes that believe, beloved, we need to be in the house of God. There's a rebellion the Word of God says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. There's two things being emphasized in the Gospel of Isaiah. I believe with all of my heart the grace of God is being em emphasized, but also the government of God is being emphasized. How many believe God is in government? Amen. He's supposed to be. Amen. He sets them up. He takes them down. That's what the Word of God said. Pray for those that are in authority over you. That's what the Word of God said. Didn't say if you agreed with them, pray for them. Pray for them, whether you agree with them or not. Not always easy, but I tell you, it's always right. Beloved, I believe that Isaiah, the first thing he's pointing out here is the rebellion. You think about in Deuteronomy chapter 21, I won't take time to read the verses. But a rebellious son was to be stoned. Listen to me. I'm telling you, beloved, we're living under an age and day of grace. I believe we're pictured, uh, we have a picture of that over there with the, the prodigal son. He rebelled, said, give me what's coming to me. He went out to the far country and the father met him. I'm glad we have a God of grace that will meet that son, amen, not stone that son, but was willing to take that son's punishment on Calvary so he could be saved by the grace of God. When he comes to himself and realizes he sinned against the holy God. Beloved, this morning, it's hard to think about, but can America the beautiful become America in bondage? Let me say this. Listen to me carefully. There are fathers in Bloomingdale 
that used to have a, a wonderful testimony, a beautiful testimony, a beautiful home, a beautiful family that traded it for bondage. There are mothers in Bloomingdale. Last night, the reason they were where, where, where they were and doing what they were doing is because they traded that beauty for bondage. You say, preacher, they ain't none of God's people ever going to do that. I'm reading to you about a whole nation that turned their back on God. Amen. And beloved, listen, God wants us to understand in America that there will be a price to pay for turning our back on God. The first thing that I see here is rebellion. It's as a sin of witchcraft. The Bible said that in the Exodus 15, 13, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Everybody in this society wants to think about this gentle Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. This gentle Jesus can also bring judgment. And beloved, listen, the bondage. God would use heathen nations to punish Israel and to punish Judah because of their rebellion. I believe Beloved, listen, God wants us to see that America the beautiful can become America in bondage. There's people sitting here today. I'm talking about sitting here and standing here today who once had a child that was beautiful. And now they're in bondage. Am I right or am I wrong? You say, preacher, are you putting them down? No. I'm telling you how serious it is. I'm telling you how serious the decisions that we make in life and the effect that they can have. Beloved Israel has made some decisions. Judah has made some decisions that's going to cost them in their relationship and their fellowship with God. You, let me give you this. The next thing I see in the message that God spoke to my heart about. I see the rebellion, but I see a remnant. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Honestly, God encouraged me right here because I do believe there's a remnant in America. Beloved, if you will go with me, look at this verse of Scripture with me over here in verse number 9. The Bible said, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us, what's the next two words? Very small. The remnant is very small. We should have been as Sodom and we should have been as Gomorrah. I don't know exactly what's going on right here in my heart, but I know this. The Lord, I believe, gave me some peace. What he's saying to them right here is if it hadn't have been for that remnant, that very small group that loved me and stuck with me and, and stayed with the word of God and stayed with the truth, he said, then I would have judged the nation of Israel and Judah just like I did Sodom and Gomorrah. You say, preacher, where did you find hope? I'll tell you where I found hope. Beloved, I thank God I've had the privilege to travel this country some and it's not everywhere and it's not in the majority but I promise you, Brother Don will tell you the same thing as he traveled. There's a remnant of God's people, people that love God, love the Bible, love the songs of Zion, love the Holy Ghost and now we need revival in this land and know that we can never become like Laodicea, and say we're rich and increased with goods and we have need of nothing and know that we need God in this generation that we live in. Beloved, we're not going to give an account for others. But in this room, if God, Brother, Brother Brian, he brought out it this morning in Sunday school about the record, something about the record maybe for this week. What if Brother Brian, God brought out the record of the hours that was spent in prayer versus the hours that was spent in recreation versus the hours that was spent in television versus the hours that was spent sleeping? We better wake up. We better wake up. I don't think there's a one of us that would stand here and say, oh yeah, put my record out there for the week. I want everybody to see it. 
Say amen. What about the record of our thoughts? Have our thoughts been stayed on him? I'm telling you, beloved, there's hope. You say, preacher, where's the hope? The hope is in God and in God's people, in just a little remnant. He said, they're very small, Brother Preston. They're very small, but they're there. And if it hadn't have been for them, it would have been just like Sodom and just like Gomorrah. Think about that. Think about that. I'm going to tell you something, beloved. The remnant's not only very small in America, but it's getting very smaller. Very much so. How important it is. How important it is, Charity, for Sawyer that you and Bob stay by the stuff. How important it is, Brother David, for them little babies that mommy and daddy stay by the stuff. telling you beloved there's a remnant I just thank God this morning that when he looks down among the redeemed in America I'm just one of them but thank God I'm one of them been born again been washed in the blood of Jesus I'm not heaven bound because I've been dipped in a water hole I'm heaven bound because I've been clothed in the righteousness of Christ made white by the blood of the lamb Hallelujah. What a Savior. The remnant. I'm going to read something. And I actually, I, I'm not going to name any names, but I'm going to tell you that there are some names that passed through my heart and mind when I read this. Think about the remnant. This was, uh, Brother Brian, you mentioned to me some time back, and you and Brother Grizz will both like to read in the Wall Street Journal every once in a while some good articles. Well, this was years ago. Someone in the Wall Street Journal, they wrote, what America needs more than a railway extension, more than Western irrigation, more than a low tariff, more than a bigger cotton crop, and a larger wheat crop is a revival. The kind that father and mother used to have. Now I want you to listen to this. A religion that counted it good business. I hope this pricks somebody right in your heart. One woman said one day, said to, said to the preacher, said, you got on my toes this morning. He said, that just proves one thing, honey. She said, what's that? He said, I'm a bad aim. He said, I wasn't aiming for your toes. I was aiming for your heart. I'm not asking God to get on anybody's toes. I'm asking God to prick somebody in their heart. A religion, this is the way it used to be, a religion that counted it good business to take time for family worship each morning right in the middle of wheat harvest. A religion that prompted them to quit work a half hour early on Wednesday so the whole family could get ready to go to prayer meeting. He said, preacher, you believe there's hope? Yeah, I do. But I tell you what it's going to be. It's going to be getting back to our roots. If you're sitting here this morning and there was ever a time in your heart when you was thrilled about the midweek service and you're not thrilled anymore, I pray the Holy Ghost of God will get a hold of your heart and make you realize you're part of the remnant. Amen. Amen. Say, preacher, you're mean. No, I'm not. I'm thinking about your babies and my babies and your grandbabies and my grandbabies. But if we drop the ball, the next generation's not going to have anything to run with. Help us, Jesus. A remnant. Very small, that's okay. At least I'm on the right side of Calvary. There wasn't many got saved that day when Jesus hung on that cross. But one did. Now I guarantee you if he could talk to you this morning, he'd say, I'm so glad. I'm so glad I changed my mind about who Jesus is. I'm glad I looked over and said, Lord, remember me. When thou comest into thy kingdom. 
there's a remnant. I believe with all of my heart, beloved, that God wants to help us. He wants to help us in these days. Can America the beautiful? Do you think, you think Israel ever thought, man, we'll never be in bondage? The victories that God had given them. You think they ever thought, let me ask you this. You think they ever got too big for their britches? Let me ask you this. You think America's a little bit too big for her britches? We better remember what freedom cost. Help us, Jesus. Help us. Help us. Brother Don, when you preached that message on the parable of the mustard seed, one of the things that, that I got out of that was that true church may not be getting bigger and bigger. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah, you can. Oh, beloved, listen, you can push the pulpit out of the way. And you can have you something that sounds like ought to be played in a dance concert. And you can draw the crowds. Am I telling it right? right. That's not the remnant I'm interested in being a part of. You could listen to me. I thank God for what Brother Mike sang and what the choir sang and what the, the church sang this morning. You say, preacher, y'all sing them old songs. By the grace of God, we're going to keep singing them. I'll tell you why. I've been saved over 30 years and they ain't never got old. Amen. Sing me another song about Jesus. Tell me a, a song about his love. Amen. His grace. Can America, the beautiful become American bondage? Answer me. Answer me. You sure can. Would we really believe that? And we set out to do something about it. God will help us. Set out, Brother Preston. Say, God, I want that flag flying when Silas graduates high school. God, I want that flag flying. That boy has to go off on the other shore and fight for this country. I want that flag to still be flying. I want the truth of God's word to still be being proclaimed. There's rebellion. Then in verse number 10, the Bible said, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I'm full of burnt offerings of rams and fed the fat and the fat of the fed beast. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear, before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? He said, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, your soul hateth, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I'm weary to bear them. Then you spread forth, when you spread forth your hands, see, they weren't doing that then. But God said, because of the way you're doing. What he's looking at here, this is the third thing in the message. There's rebellion, then there's a remnant. And here is what we call religion. It's the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Beloved, I'm going to tell you something. I believe this world is eat up with that. Eat up with it. You say, preacher, what do you believe the, 
the answer is, well, over there in the book of Revelation, when Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, had left its first love, they were to remember from whence they had fallen. They were to repent. Repentance is not just a word for sinners. I don't believe there will ever be a genuine revival without genuine repentance. When the Spirit of God comes down among His people and makes bare our sin, helps us to get right with one another and helps us to get right with God, that's what revival looks like. Somebody said, well, we'd like to see a bunch of people saved. Well, the, the Word of God said it like this, judgment must first begin at the house of God. I believe that. It was a religion that they were experiencing that did not change their conduct. If you have a religion that doesn't change your conduct, then that's all you have is religion. The Bible speaks of religion in a positive way when it says pure and undefiled religion. Religion is this. It talks about taking care of the, the poor and the needy and the widows. But beloved, I'm telling you, this world is full of religion that makes God sick, just like it was in this day. Full of it. Reminded me of a statement. I don't know if it was original with my pastor, with Brother Danny Sykes, but... He made a statement one day, and it stuck in my heart. He said, if you believe right, you'll behave right. And I believe that. I believe a belief that doesn't change your behavior is not the right belief. I believe when a man meets Jesus, he changes. He's a new creature in Christ Jesus. A form of godliness, denying the power thereof. Their religion, in essence, was nothing more than idolatry. Beloved, today, I say this. Modernism is killing the churches in America today. Brother Ralph, I still pray that God will fill our church up. I believe that's a scriptural prayer. Brother Steve, as we go out and visit, the Bible said to go out and compel him to come in that my house may be filled. That's what it said. But I'm going to tell you something today. This world is full of churches that are much more interested in a crowd than they are the Christ. I say, God help us. If we ever get to the place where we would compromise and rather see a crowd than see the Christ that loved us and gave himself for us. Can America the beautiful, can it become America in bondage? I want to close with this this morning. I didn't know if I'd get done with this chapter. There's no way this morning we'll come back tonight. You think about God being gracious enough to speak to hearts. And that same heart that God has spoken to turning Sunday after Sunday and going out those doors unchanged. I'd never read this before that I can remember anyway. Aaron Burr was a grandson of the great Jonathan Edwards. I can't hear Jonathan Edwards' name without thinking of a sermon that he preached entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And just to prove to you, you know, there was a day, especially among Baptists, that if you had any kind of notes in front of you, they thought you wasn't a preacher. My grandpa told a story about a man that was preaching and it was a shame in those days to have notes and the 
pulpit was built out of knotty pine, so he got to church real early, and he took his notes, and he rolled them up in a little roll, stuck, stuck them in a knot hole in the pulpit. Well, now the, the pulpit wasn't built like this. It didn't have a door underneath. It was just hollow on the inside. And he got up, and he was leading in prayer, and he reached down there to get his notes, and he pushed them on off on the inside. And he got up, and he said, uh, after he prayed, he, him hauled around a little bit, and he said, folks, there's a real good message up here in this pulpit. If somebody come up here and help me get it out. <laughs> there was a day when it was frowned upon, but Jonathan Edwards actually wrote and rewrote and wrote and rewrote and got up and read the sermon. You say, preacher, uh, surely God didn't do nothing. Surely God did. God's not interested in my method or style. God's interested in the Holy Ghost showing up and doing a work in hearts and lives. And he can do it with one man preaching in a loud voice, another man preaching in a still small voice. It don't matter to God. We can't limit God. But Jonathan Edwards had a grandson. His name was Aaron Burr. On, a, on one occasion, think about this. Uh, Jonathan was conducting meetings at Princeton. Think about that. Not in a church, in a college in America, preaching the gospel. Well, his grandson got under conviction, said there was a great spiritual movement in the school. And one night, Jonathan Edwards preached on the subject, the mastery of Jesus. Aaron Burr was deeply stirred and he went to the room of one of his professors to talk to him about making a decision for Jesus. The professor urged him not to make a decision under any sort of an emotional appeal, but to wait until after the meetings were over. Aaron Burr postponed making a decision. Let me just say this. I can't read it all without saying it. You better move when the Holy Ghost moves on you. Because there's no guarantee he'll ever have to move again. Watch this. He said, wait till the meetings are over. Aaron Burr postponed making a decision and went on to murder a great American. He had that duel with Alexander Hamilton and to betray his country. When he was an old man, a young man came to him and said, Mr. Burr, I want you to meet a friend of mine. Aaron Burr said, who is he? The young man replied, he is Jesus Christ, the Savior of my soul. A cold sweat broke out on the forehead of Aaron Burr. And he replied, 60 years ago, I told God if he would leave me alone, I'd leave him alone. And he has kept his word. It's a dangerous thing to walk away from the God that loves you enough to die for you on an old rugged cross and enough to visit you by his Holy Spirit and prick your heart, convict your heart of sin, of righteousness, and of the judgment that's to come. He's a good God, ladies and gentlemen. I highly recommend this friend of mine his name is Jesus. You go in a lot of churches today and you won't hear his name. But I tell you around here, we want to make much of Jesus. Because if we'll make much of Jesus, Jesus will make much of his presence in our midst. Amen. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you this morning for the privilege to come in the house of God once again. Lord, it's my prayer that we would realize that America the beautiful is well on our way. I always thought, Lord, when I was a kid that it'd be some kind of a big bomb or something that might take us out as a country. But Lord, we're destroying ourselves from within. Lord, there's a remnant. I believe, Lord, that many of the people 
if not most of the people that I'm speaking to today are part of that remnant, blood washed, born again. They want the truth, even when the truth hurts. I do pray today, our Lord, that you forgive us, that you'd help us, our Lord, to return to the principles of thy word. God, there is no hope outside of the God of all grace, the God of all comfort, the God of all hope. Lord, this morning, there could be someone here, Lord, I know there is. I prayed for some of them last night. It's not part of that remnant. God, I pray. You'd speak to their heart. Draw them, Lord, with cords of compassion. And help us, our Lord. God, maybe in this invitation, you'd so break our hearts that we'd flood the throne of grace in prayer, begging for forgiveness, begging for your presence, begging for your power, begging our Lord that the church would be the light she once was in America. Lord, I pray. Lord, help us. Lord, that person that's here today that doesn't know for sure if they died today, they'd go to heaven. God, I pray you'd give that person what they need today. Some need assurance without a doubt, and some need salvation. God, I pray for that Christian, that Christian that used to be excited about the Bible, used to be excited about witnessing, used to be excited about prayer meeting. God, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I beg you to send revival. Let it be kidding me. Help us, Lord. Let America the beautiful may remain America the beautiful and not become America in bondage. We're standing together this morning. If you need this altar, would you come? Would you come?